Well, I went to World War II and went in when I was quite young, 17. So then we got the GI Bill and I go to college. And amazingly, you know, most of uh, people like me uh, begin to think they can be broadcasters in their, when they're kids. And now today they see all the TV, so they're sure of it. But I listen to radio, so I, for some reason, thought I could do play-by-play. -play. And uh, I used to practice with a little spinner game out on the farm I lived on. And uh, I had a whole summer of uh, baseball using my local team, the Muskogee Giants at that time, or the Muskogee Reds then. So then I went to college and uh, started studying speech, writing, everything, acting. And then uh, at, in, our, in uh, Northeastern Oklahoma, at Northeastern State. And then my wife and I moved to uh, Denver, Colorado, because I had hay fever so bad in Oklahoma. It, <clears throat> and there was nothing to do for it in those days. So we went up to Denver, and the University of Denver had a little wired wireless radio set up that probably nobody ever heard. And I decided to investigate it because it looked like something I could do. And they were just playing some music. And I said, what about doing sports? And said, well, we don't have anybody. And I said, well, I can do it. <laughs> <laughs> so I got together and we went out and uh, when we uh, and did football games uh, live and then basketball games. But you know, that's learning all by myself how to make spotting boards and how to be able to recognize the players and all that. It was a wonderful, wonderful time, and I had a bunch of guys who were interested in playing around with it too. So that's where I really learned uh, basics of what I thought was broadcasting. And I would love to have had some of those games to listen to because it must have been, must have been something. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then. Uh, out of college became a news, uh, well, the news department at a little station in Fort Collins, Colorado. And then I moved on and finally got back to my hometown of Muskogee. And it wasn't a very good year, that year of going from Fort Collins to La Junta to Galveston and then back. So I told my wife, well, I'll go back to college and, and I get a law degree or something. And she went down to get a job teaching. and. Uh, the superintendent remembered me from the years I was in high school here. Hey, what's Bill doing? She said, well, he's looking for a job as sportscaster. Oh, I know, just, they got a they got an opening down at KBIX in Muskogee. So I ran down there and uh, fortunately the manager was not as smart as I was in knowing what qualifications should be. And I gave him a they were not exactly lying, but I told him I had done University of Denver and, and all this, and I had in a way. So the deal was, <clears throat> okay, you can do this game Friday in uh, Enid, Oklahoma. Uh, that was on a Monday I was for the job. Do it Friday in Enid, Oklahoma. If you're okay, we'll hire you. If not, you're fired. <clears throat> and we'll pay you $10 a week for the game, and you have to be a staff announcer and get minimum wage, which was uh, at that time a dollar or something. So I'd make $40 a week plus $10 in the football. But the guys at KMUS then called me and said, hey, why don't you come over here and do sports? You can do football, basketball, minor league baseball. Uh, the minor league baseball just really tweaked me. I said, okay, so I went over there. That was when about two weeks later, they said, oh, by the way, forgot to tell you, we do a wrestling show once a month. I said, really? <laughs> what? How's that? And he said, well, it's at the Civic Auditorium, and you go down there, and you broadcast it live. I said, I don't know a thing about wrestling, or wrestling, or whatever it was. And they said, I've only seen it once in Chicago on TV. And they said, well, Go down there and talk to promoters. You got one going on tonight, and uh, we're not going to do that one, of course. But go down there, and he'll introduce you around, and you can learn some stuff and watch it. So these were two great guys, young guys, who had the promotion there. And uh, Danny McShane and uh, Wild Red Berry were in on the program that night. And a couple of real characters. Mm -hmm. And so the promoter said, hey, you two, show him the holes, but don't hurt him. 
<laughs> and I was appreciative of that. So I got to have, you know, all the locks and this and all that stuff. Well, I had a legal pad and I wrote down what they looked like to me, each hold. And then the first time I went out to broadcast it, I would check my pad and, uh, and try to keep up. And I actually found it fun. You know, it was fun on radio. And I could do much anything I wanted. And so that's, I did that for three years. All, so those, all this was just radio? All radio, that's all. Uh, tele, I don't, they were getting a TV station into the area by then. It was a satellite from Tulsa. So uh, in 1953, one of the guys who used to be at the station in Muskogee went through Dallas to KRLD TV and had some friends there. He was talking to the uh, announcing director and said, uh, they said, I got to find some guy to do Saturday, uh, Tuesday Night Live Sportatorium. And uh, my friend said, oh, I know the greatest wrestling announcer in the world. <laughs> and I later told him, I said, boy, you really kind of oversold that. And because uh, I'd never done television. So I took the Katie train down to Dallas, auditioned, came back, and I told my wife, well, I don't know about that. I, reading commercials and all this stuff. And they called me in a few days and said, how about coming down here and doing the wrestling and being a staff announcer? I said, of all the things I wanted to do, <laughs> the first thing is wrestling, which I never knew anything about. I go to Dallas, but that's fine. However you can get there. What, what was... Uh... Your, what was your perception of wrestling? Because I, I know being a, uh, a, a newscaster and a sports thing, you might have, a lot of people might have looked down on wrestling just because of the type of uh, sport it was. No, you know, I, I studied some acting, and I've been in, in a lot of plays. And I looked at wrestling, and I thought, now, these guys are acting a lot. At the same time, they're knocking each other around the ring, and occasionally there's blood. I don't know how they get it, but there's blood. And they're throwing each other up and down on the... And I said... I'm just going to do it like any other sport. And that was my idea. Now I talked to other guys who made fun of it when they broadcast and all that, but I respected them. And I found out that they were a lot of fun to be around on those Tuesday nights. And some of them I was a little afraid of. And then I made friends with various ones like Fritz von Erich and Duke Kiyomuka and, and then later on, you know, the other guys that came along. So I, I respected them for what they were doing because it was entertainment, physical entertainment. And I didn't see any reason not to just do it the way I did play-by-play. Play. I mean, I thought it was, I just didn't feel like I could lure myself to try to make fun of something that I couldn't do and that people really enjoyed. I mean, they, and the Sportatorium, as lousy as it was, was filled up every Tuesday night. Uh, women in dresses, men in suits. That was 53, 54. You know. So I, I just found a, a niche of uh, what I call my hobby. And uh, what I was, and I started doing high school football down there and it just kind of built. <clears throat> and then in, um, it was about 55, 56, I guess, uh, CBS by that time took over all the nighttime time. So Tuesday night wrestling. I was not there anymore to do live. So we moved it over and made it studio wrestling mm -hmm. in one of the big studios at Channel 4. And that was a kick. <laughs> we would do it in the morning, usually, about 10 o'clock. And we would announce that we had studio wrestling, you know, going to studio wrestling. And the people would line up outside the, st the studio building and uh, come in. And the people that did that were really intriguing to be around at 10 o'clock in the morning to watch wrestling. So would you say the fans that followed wrestling were a little different than maybe the baseball? The, <laughs> the dear wrestling fans, again, I respect them. It was their great moment to be around those guys, you know, and they were sure everybody was killing each other. And, and they, were, they were fun. And you know, we had the typical woman with the but if she had a cane, she'd hit them going by, you know, down the sport of tribe. So they all came then, as many as we could put in the studio. And uh, we did studio wrestling for a long time until 
1959, I guess it's 58, 59, and I went into uh, baseball. And of course, I didn't have any time after that because I was working night. But before we, I'll tell you what, <laughs> the guys over at the Times Herald, the Dallas Times Herald, the newspaper that owned our station, the sports guys would just give me the devil all the time about, oh, you and your wrestling class. Well, what do they pay you to talk good about them and all this? Stuff? I said, I'll tell you what, Frank, uh, Frank Boggs and Bob Galt, why don't you guys just come over one morning and, uh, and sit down right down beside the ring and watch it and just see, because you're going to be the closest you'll ever be to wrestling, and you'll see how they really work. And so they came over, sat right down the ringside, and we went through the whole thing. And uh, after one bout, Von Erich was in, Fritz, I had an interview with him, and Fritz was thinking about retiring or turning good, you know, because of the boys coming up. And we knew that, but we hadn't talked about it yet. So in this, this interview, while these two guys are sitting right there, I said, Fritz, uh, there are some uh, cynics, critics, a couple of guys from the Times Herald, Frank Boggs and uh, Bob Gall, who think you're just about over the hill, and that maybe your time has come. And, it, and so Fritz, you know, oh, wow, you are gonna kill him, I'll find him and beat him up. <laughs> And so we started the next bout. I look over, those two guys are gone. <laughs> Frank and Bob, they left. Sure. So, and they weren't quite certain what we were doing. <laughs> well, after the bout was over, Fritz, Fritz said, are those guys over there? I said, yeah, let's go over and see them. Oh, yeah. I'm gonna... So we went over to the Times here. We go up to the elevator, get off on the sports floor. And he starts in that huge voice, where are those guys, Galt and Box? I want to throw them out the window. <laughs> and it was really fun. And Frank has never forg forgotten about that. One of the great moments of his life, <laughs> thinking he was going to be killed by Fritz von Erich. So we had a good time with it. And uh, I always try to have a good time with, with my broadcasting. And, uh, so after that, I was out of it for quite a while. I'd go back in occasionally when somebody was sick or some, had to fill in, and I'd go along. Yeah, that uh, wrestling opened up the door in Dallas. And when I came in to that area, uh, the uh, Southwest Conference was on uh, their own broadcast. And they used guys you know, at the various stations. A friend of mine at KRLD was broadcasting. But I had to start down. So I started with the high school sports and got to Plum, which was Highland Park in Dallas, and the rich area and everybody, and people that were influential. Then I got to know them pretty well. Uh, 1959 was an interesting year because uh, KRLD searching madly for programming. And, they didn't, you know, those big stations didn't have people who could run DJ shows, and they didn't understand that. Like, so they they got the baseball. I mean, the Highland Park High School. So I started doing that. At the same time, I was doing my sports show on TV one day, and I asked somebody, "Where is this little school, North Texas State College?" Oh, it's up the road, 30 miles. I said, "Oh, okay," because I was tired. I'd do SMU and TCU and and some of the others, but that was generally all we had then. And uh, so I drove up there with my little handy camera, 16 millimeter film, and uh, shot film of North Texas football practices or before the season started. I was the first reporter, TV reporter, who had ever gone up there to cover them at that time, 59. You know, Why were they ignored? Cause they were a little, they were only uh, about uh, 5,000 students, 6,000 and SMU and TCU were the big guys, mm -hmm. and of course Texas and A&M. So nobody paid any attention to them. And I went up and shot and ran it on, on my uh, sports show. And being a neophyte <laughs> photographer, while they were running plays, I got down in front of them and squatted down in front of the center to get a really good shot, and they ran right over me, <laughs> which was another good shot of me on my back. Then uh, 
that led to my doing the games for them. At the same time, I started doing baseball. Uh, they had a triple-A team that came in, and uh, KRLD got the rights to that. So all that worked in my favor in around 1958-59. I was doing, all of a sudden, triple-A baseball, North Texas football, and Highland Park football. And I was so busy, I never... <laughs> I, so you must have been working five to seven days a week? Oh, at least seven, yeah. Because yeah. Yeah. I had to change my schedule so I could get off times. And it, but it, it was the greatest time of my life. And we were just going full blast. At that point, that was the greatest time. And I did, I guess, pretty well because things went along okay. I was at KRLD then until 1964, 1963, and guys in the business now don't understand this. I was a news reporter as well as a sports reporter and also did commercials and whatever else they wanted to do around the station, you know. And guy, what, you didn't specialize? Said, yeah, I was specializing in sports, news, and commercials, <laughs> and that. Uh, that was the difference of the, the, of the game then. And 63 then came the Kennedy assassination. And uh, we, uh, I was producing the new news at that time, uh, putting it all together from the night before, and then I'd go in and, and announce it. We didn't have anchors then. I was just announcing the new news while Oswald was killing Kennedy. And all the guys were out for the parade, you know, and all this stuff. So I came back across the street. I didn't even know what had happened, and the newsroom was in turmoil. People were crying and yelling, and, and so the rest of the afternoon, I worked in the newsroom. All the uh, reporters came in. You know, they were beat. They had filmed and edit, and so my news director, Eddie Barker, sent me over to the Dallas Police Department. I got there about 6.30 or 7, and uh, it was, the name of our book is When the News Went Live. And they took, uh, your camera's about this big. Our cameras were those old studio cameras, you know, about that big. And uh, the engineer, uh, they had an elevator, so they carried it up the elevator. They ran a cable out the window to our remote unit truck. Now that truck and the cameras were never used except to do football games out at the Cotton Bowl. They never did news because it, you couldn't pick all that stuff up and run around to a news uh, program, you know, in town. So <clears throat> we did that. They put the, the, and shot it, uh, microwaved it over to the station, and then it went on to CBS in New York. And what, whatever they wanted, they would take. So I went up there. I had an engineer, Howard Chamberlain, uh, on the camera, and, uh, and I had a microphone about this long in my hand. And we had this hallway, which was about as narrow as this area right here. Uh, I thought it was pretty wide, but when I went back over there later, I don't know how we even operated that thing. So I walked up and down in there, and I'd walk over to interview somebody, because by doing news as well as sports, we knew all the people in town. I knew all the sheriff people, all the police. And as they came in, I went over. But anyway. <laughs> The, new, the, the outside press started coming in. And of course, everybody could come in there in those days. You didn't have to have any checking through machines or anything. You just came up and said, I'm media, you know. So I had this microphone in my hand, and I was setting the cable, and this really heavy set guy with a lot of little cameras all over his body said to me, what's that for? And I said, oh, this? This is a microphone. What are you going to use it for? I said, well, I'm going to walk around, and I'm going to interview people. And he said, well, if that cable gets in my way, I'll just rip it out. And I <laughs> said, I tell you what, you rip a cable out, and you're going to have this microphone right across your head, forgetting that everything is going live. <laughs> so the engineer comes down and says, you, you OK? I said, yeah, I'm OK now. And he said, why? I said, well, we just heard what you said to the guy about the uh, So after that, I didn't make any outside comments. you know. But it was a horrendous night, five hours of banging around and trying to get views, and Oswald comes in, and Marina comes in, and 
all this stuff going on and doing interviews. I interviewed Jerry Hill, who was one of those who captured Oswald in the theater, and Arch McDonald, the other one. And uh, so at around midnight, the police are being so good to the media. They don't want them to think that this is a cover-up, and, and they were really good people at that time. I mean, they, we could just walk in the chief's office and say, hi, chief, I want to, you know, in those days. Can't do that anymore. But uh, they announced in the hall, we're going to have uh, Oswald down in the basement lock, uh, mock-up room for a press conference if you want to come down there and ask him questions. Here's a guy hasn't even been charged yet. I think they, you know, that he's. They think he is the killer, and they're going to have a press conference with him. <laughs> it was a little naive, so but great engineers took the camera downstairs and set it up. Uh, Gene Pashalik then was behind the camera, and there's a picture on the front page of our book where the news went live. I'm standing by the camera, and Gene Pashalik is behind the camera. But, and that caused a lot of problems in putting the book together because I knew that I had gone over and knelt down in front of Oswald with my mic so we could hear if anything. Couldn't hear a thing because everybody was yelling and screaming and acting ridiculous trying to get some. So I knelt down in front of Oswald with this microphone. And the reporter next to me, who was also kneeling there, said, uh, hey, uh, Oswald, have you been charged with anything? He said, no, I haven't been charged with anything. And I, and I had just been told before I came down by somebody I respected who knew what was going on. Naturally, we had good sources. And I said, oh, you have been charged with the death of the president. It just happened. And he looked at me, and if you've ever seen that, and uh, walked out. He didn't say, well, thanks a lot. Or, <laughs> but that was my moment of fame. In fact, my son, uh, when I went, and we were worried about that picture because, and I was worrying about writing in the book that I was over underneath or un, before him because here's a picture I'm standing over the camera, and so we're writing the stuff, and uh, I said, Bob, I, my the lead writer, I said, I'm not sure about this anymore. Maybe I dreamed it. He said, No, and my son happened to call from here and said, Just saw some stuff you did last on the. Uh, on the assassination, and I heard you tell Oswald that he'd been charged. And I said, you sure? Oh yeah, it was your voice, I know your voice. So that's how careful we were to try to make this book as factual as possible. I left KRLD in 64. 65, my Dean of uh, Radio TV at North Texas said, I told me, since I was freelancing, he said, well, we're going to uh, I'll tell you what you're going to do. You're going to go to school, uh, get your master's, and you're going to teach radio TV here. We're going to put a radio station on in a couple of years, and you'll run the whole thing. I said, okay. Sounds good. I didn't know. <laughs> I wasn't doing anything else at the time. That was 65, and that was in the spring. And uh, they called me from the, uh, my friend Joe Macko is one of the ball players, and, and uh, called me and said, hey Bill, we got to, we're moving out to this new stadium, we want you to do the broadcast. Because I'd been doing a minor league ball right up until the, uh, through, 60, through 65. And then I'd freelance it around another station. So I said, okay, so I'll go out to the new stadium. Dallas Fort Worth Spurs and start doing baseball. At the same time, I'm starting to go to college to get a master's. At the same time, uh, I'm called uh, by the Cowboys and said, uh, "How about doing color on the broadcast this fall?" Or this, and out of the blue, they call. And it's you know, it's kind of like, "Okay, you're going to do wrestling in KMUS, Wisconsin." Out of the blue, I said, "Yeah." I'll I do the rest. I do the Cowboys. So there I am, going to college, doing baseball, and now doing the Dallas Cowboys, and also doing North Texas football. <laughs> what, what greater thing can that be? 
Well, every city in, in that time had the like the one guy that kind of everybody knew about the, the reputable sports yeah. guy. You you were it for that. Well, I was the only play-by-play -play guy around there at some period of time. You know, Frank Lieber had gone up to Cleveland, and somebody else went somewhere, and I would, and and you build a reputation by doing the other stuff, baseball and football, and so uh, they called, and so I went and do that. And then the next year, '66, when I got my master's, then I was doing play-by-play -play for the <laughs> for the Cowboys and beginning teaching. So it it was quite a trip, quite a trip, and. Uh, then in, uh, I did the Cowboys, then the Rangers came in, I did that two years, moved to Chicago, uh, was to uh, replace Harry Carey after the second year there, but the ball club had to sell, the owner, John Allen, had to sell the club, and that nullified my contract, and uh, the new owner came in, Bill Vick, and some backers. <clears throat> and so they, naturally, they took Harry back. Because he, he was Chicago. I mean, you know, hard to work with, difficult to work with, almost impossible at times for a, another announcer. But he was, he was what Chicago was all about. Brash, drunk, on the air. <laughs> and, he, and he stayed with the country for another 20 years. Oh, yeah. I mean, and had a stroke and still t tried to do it. And so he was, he was the guy. And I, I never got another baseball job. Uh, but I started teaching, uh, had been teaching, so I went back to teaching. And that turned out to be, I guess, the best thing I ever did in the fact that uh, out of that program that we had at North Texas, the guy at University of Texas, Austin, was one of my students. Dave Barnett was doing uh, ESPN. He was the youngest announcer ever hired to do an NBA broadcast back when uh, uh, the Spurs, uh, the San Antonio Spurs. Then he went to the Texas Rangers. Uh, Mark Folliwell was doing the, uh, the Dallas Mavericks now. I'm, you know, we had all these kids that came out of that program, and yeah, they were, it's not all my, you know, oh, I'm the teacher, and, uh, but I taught a good program, but these guys were just naturals, and I just polished them. And so that is something I'd look on, and I still have, uh, I, I taught until about 2007. Off and uh, I still got guys up in Oklahoma and North Dakota and around who are still out of there working. I'm working at KVIL when I got back from Chicago, and uh, KVIL was the best at that time. The best. Uh, radio station in Dallas uh, play, you know, kind of a rock and roll, but not exactly. It was, they were playing the, the best music. Ron Chapman was the best DJ ever in Dallas. And we had a staff, which was really funny. Everybody in the staff was middle-aged, and I was the oldest. And I was doing the morning sports with him. And uh, there was a young kid named Mickey Grant, who you've seen on the video. And Mickey was a gopher for Ron, and whatever Ron wanted to have done, Mickey ran around the town or the country and got it and did it. But he and I would talk about wrestling, and uh, he said, you know, I've always been interested in that, and you've done it. And I said, yeah. And at that time, Channel 11 was doing wrestling with the big cameras. They had two, one for a wide shot and one for medium close-ups. But they never got really close, you know. Mm -hmm. They never got in top of it. They were close up would be, you know, pretty fairly tight, but not. And that was what. And uh, so after that, when I got out of uh, baseball, then I went back and did wrestling for for Fritz von Erich, who was a promoter. And I was doing wrestling while I was at KVIL. All these things come back around. So Mickey and I would talk about what what could we do about that. And I said, well. You got to get more production into it. It's it's dull. I mean, it's just wide shot, medium shot. And lo and behold, here come the new video cameras. You know, the uh, and they're the portable. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking through a broadcasting magazine. I said, so Mickey, I said, Mickey, 
if we ever get this on the air here somewhere, we can use these cameras. And so Mickey went out and did Hollywood for a while. Then he came back and uh, got a job at Channel 39 as program director. And uh, that was the 700 Club station. And so they're talking about what programming they do, and Mickey brings up Ratley. Oh, on the Christian sure show, <laughs> on the Christian station. <laughs> and they said, wrestling? Oh, yeah. And we have some new ideas on how to do it. And they said, well, show us a video. Show us an audition tape. So we got their cameras that were handheld then, you know, fairly large. And they had some really good, Oz Coleman is one of their, still around as a uh, cameraman. What we did then, we said, okay, get up on the side of the ring. And the wrestler said, whoa, that's too close to us. You might see, you know, something that we don't want you to see. <laughs> and we said, don't worry about that. Nobody's going to notice. It's going to be moving so fast. So we had two guys with handheld cameras. And then we mic'd the ring around to get the sound on the floor and the grunts and groans and yells. And, and we made an audition tape. And Fritz von Eric was awed by this thing. He hadn't seen anything like it. And the station was good. Gosh, I've never seen this. Even the WW, whatever it was then, back in New York, wasn't doing that. And so we tried to get Fritz to backroll this. But Fritz was... He's like every promoter. Yeah, every promoter. <laughs> and then he wanted total charge of it. And we said, no, no, no. And we have to have a percentage. And he said, well, you give me 10%. No, 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 no. So we went to 39, and they, and they did it. And uh, I'm telling you, we, we didn't know what was going to happen. You know, so, and they were going to syndicate it around, as well as Channel 39. And it started off kind of quietly. And boy, before long, they started popping up all over, selling syndications. And uh, explain exactly what that means. I mean, you're 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 throwing around a word that a lot of people here don't oh, yeah. understand. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, that sometimes is bad. <laughs> a syndicate. So so you were filming the wrestling and you were taking a tape product and you were selling it to tapes. An, another party. That's right. And when we really realized it was really going great, we they were just adding stations right and left. You know, independent stations. They couldn't take network. And then lo and behold. We find out that it's overseas, and uh, I'd walk across the campus, and he's, we had quite a few students that came over from the Mideast during sort of a problem over there, which is always a problem, I guess. And these guys, I, I knew they were from Jordan or where or someplace, they'd come running across the campus. You're the wrestling announcer. I said, yeah, how'd you know that? Well, it's in our country. And I said, really, where's your country? Israel, Jordan. Uh, so it had been syndicated all the way over to there. All of a sudden, we find out it's in Lebanon, it's in Jordan, it's in Israel, all through the Middle East. And finally, the guy from, uh, we got a report that Fritz and uh, the, uh, the two boys, Fritz and the two sons, uh, David and uh, Kevin, were the leading TV wrestling personalities or the personalities in Israel, and I was number four. I was the fourth most popular TV personality in Israel, and I still haven't been there yet. <laughs> why do you think? Uh, why do you think it caught on in a place like Israel? I don't really know. Uh, you know, there's something alluring about people throwing each other around, and goes back to the Greeks and their wrestling, and keeps wrestling going all these years. I had a friend who was from uh, Nazareth. Uh, Israel, who was a student at North Texas. He was a soccer kicker, and he also uh, kicked field goals at extra points. He was quite good. So he calls me one day and he said, Bill, I said, yeah, my family, every week when the wrestling comes on, they shut down all the shops in Nazareth, and, the, and people come to the homes where they have TVs, and they watch the wrestling show. And they said, I talked to my mother, and she doesn't believe that I know the Von Erichs and you. <laughs> because David and Kevin went to North Texas for a while. And uh, before they, and Kevin's knees went out, and, and David just wanted to do that. So, 
So one day we called his mother and his family in Nazareth. And they were so excited. And they said, the one who could speak English asked me, because does he really know the Von Erics? I said, yes, he knows the Von Erics. They went to school here. And he knows you. <laughs> I said, yes. And, it, you know, it was fantastic. It was just fantastic how that little show took off. WWE people, when they bought all the stuff from Kevin, all the tapes and all the film, later on, much, what, five, six, eight years ago, yeah. Lady called me and she said, I want to tell you something. You and Mickey, you and Mickey started this, didn't you? And I said, yeah. You were first. Nobody had even thought of shooting wrestling that way, getting up on the ring, getting in the ring to do interviews, uh, following them around on the floor. Uh, they used to run, those, those poor photographers, they must have lost 15 pounds. And so we just, you know, walked into something we didn't really know, and this is the way we wanted to do it. Just to be clear, you're, you had a business stake in terms of the syndication? No, no, I got... You didn't give in on that? Oh, no, <laughs> no. So the syndication, I guess we mentioned that then, we sent tapes everywhere, and they paid the station for the right to carry it, and then they did their own commercials. No, I got paid a weekly salary, about $250, which is pretty good. Uh, in Dallas at the time. And Mickey, I guess, I don't even know if he got a, a, a percentage of it. He should have in the station, but I don't know how they ran that. So, and I don't get any uh, residuals <laughs> anymore, neither does Mickey. So we didn't get anything except the enjoyment of setting a new style of wrestling. Well, uh, Fritz found religion sometime, uh, and, and that sounds bad, but I'd never known or thought of them as being religious. But as happens, uh, he met a minister, an evangelical minister, and started going to, and they got very close. And I think if Fritz never said it, but he started having more of a religious feeling. Uh, he wanted me to have the minister up to do color. And I said, no, we're not going to do that. I mean, if you want to talk about God yourself when you interview or something, that's you. But I'm not in the station, even the station, where the 700 Club. And that may have been a part, too, because he'd go over there and they'd have their prayer meetings at times, and Fritz went over, and uh, so it just kind of, it kind of evolved from a point of, oh, what's this going on? Mm -hmm. And it was, uh, the people at the station had to go, when they had meetings, they had a prayer session before every meeting. Naturally, you know, it was uh, the way it's set up. So Fritz go over, and since we had the program over there, and it was kind of surprising too, when David died, of that interview we did with them and the boys, I think it's on, it's on the documentary, uh, that was when it really came to life that when uh, Fritz started talking about uh, David is dead and he's okay and now we have to uh, do something in his memory and God is with us and all that. Uh, that he talked about. And uh, that was the first that I think was really blatant in a sense of talking about religion in relation to them. And so the boys uh, followed along in that line. Uh, and then Kerry went out and won the championship over Ric Flair at the, uh, out at the football stadium, 43,000 people there. And then uh, uh, Kevin didn't mention it as much, but Kerry did, and Kerry came along and uh, to take the place of David. He was the one that was going to be the star, and did pretty well. Uh, there were a lot of sad things uh, that happened 
and uh, that, that the tragedy is still just amazing. David died, and there must have been 10,000 people at the funeral in Denton, outside and in the, in the church. Uh, then Carrie uh, crashed his motor, or motorcycle. Michael, around that same time, had that uh, syndrome, but uh, you know, mm -hmm. his, his fever went up to 106, 107, 108. And the doctor and I became good friends because there was always some binary in trouble with medical practice, and the same doctor took care of him. And he and I talked, and I didn't use it on the air, confidentially, and he said, the boy's not going to be the same. Uh, it just that much fever and the, the length of time it was. He was surprised he lived. And so Michael was out of any plans for him. But uh, so Carrie and uh, Kevin carried them. They decided to bring in, they had needed another person, so they brought in the cousin, who was a nice looking guy, but never fit in well, and nobody ever believed it. And what was interesting too, after David died, you don't notice it really in the size of crowds and all this, but there was, as we noticed it, a sort of a slow diminution of the interest. David was the, 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 the driving force. He, and, and he, he handled Kevin really well. Kerry had to be handled well because Kerry wasn't really very smart. Uh, but once David was gone, that cheerleader, that the man in charge, the guy with all the moxie, the, the beautiful blonde guys, he, he, he was gone and it just sort of was slowly began to kind of fade. And they couldn't do anything about it. I mean, we, it took a long time. Gary then is out. <clears throat> they bring Michael back, which should never have happened. Uh, I did an interview with him that never aired. And I'm not going into details of it, but uh, he had the religious theme all through it. Uh, it. It was a kid who had a really good mind and then didn't have that mind anymore. And he and his little brother Chris had stories to tell that had no relationship to good religious people. It was a disaster. <laughs> and, and it just kept going down and down, and Michael took an overdose at the lake. Kerry lost his foot and then later fell off, and he was using drugs and uh, was going to prison, actually, and shot himself. And Chris was despondent because he couldn't do anything, so he killed himself. I mean, it was, it was one of the worst periods in time being around sports and that business that I've ever, ever been. How difficult of it? of a job as, it, as an announcer to have to go on air and, and, and talk about someone's passing, you know, particularly in, in relation to Ron Eriks. It, it happened a number of times. Well, it goes back to, for me, back to the Kennedy time when I tried to do some things about the reaction of people and all that. And, it, and that was terribly hard. But you're around this news business so much, and in sports, and people die, and people say, it becomes something where you really have to take a deep breath and uh, just try to do, talk about it, because it's a story, and you have to fill in that part of the story that they want you to fill in. I was interviewed every time somebody died. Uh, then we did some specials. And I, I look at some of those and I think, my gosh, I, I really got control. I don't know how you do it, except you think of it as, I suppose, guys you know, but you know there's death. Probably not this way, but, and you know the circumstances of the drugs and everything that went on, and you just kind of 
take a deep breath, suck it up, and do the story. Uh, <laughs> I wish I could give you a better answer. I, don't, I wouldn't want to do that again. Everybody looks back and talks about the Von Erich, you know. Dynasty. The dynasty, the whole, the whole family, and it's like, what a sad story it was. But you grew up seeing his kids play football. Basketball, what, yeah. What, what do you remember about? They were good the kids. They were tough kids because Fritz loved to talk about how he took the belt to them. And David came to North Texas to play basketball, and Jimmy Gales, the coach, said he could have been a really good basketball player. But his dad wanted him to go into wrestling. And uh, then Kevin came out to play football, but he'd hurt his knees too badly in high school, so, and he had another injury at in North Texas, so he was out. Um, Carrie was a great uh, shot putter or discus thrower in track. Uh, and uh, I was so close to those kids that I spoke at uh, some of their, like Carrie's graduation. I was a featured speaker. Uh, and other things that they would have. So I saw them when they were little and uh, they'd come to the sportatorium and they'd hang around and they always liked to hang around me because I was hanging around the wrestlers and talking. And, and they were a good bunch of kids. Uh, they got into this uh, business that was just rife with drugs, all kinds. Uh, Gino Hernandez uh, was a buddy of theirs. And I don't blame it all on him because it was... One of the young men went into Fritz von Erich one day and said, Fritz, you got a problem. So-and-so, one of your sons, is selling drugs to the wrestlers. So he fired the guy. The guy that warned him. Yeah. And, uh, Sunshine, gorgeous Jimmy Garvin's great-looking girl, for the first one we had. And that really went over big, having her up there, because she was perfect for it. She was cute, she was pretty, she was, had a, could talk, and she handled herself around the ring, and then she just faded away with the same problem. So it was, it was and then Gino Hernandez was, uh, I, I don't remember many times seeing him without some drug influence. Mm -hmm. uh, he was... So, it's safe to say the whole culture of the... Whole the culture. Of the world class, it was you just know, drugs was everywhere. Yeah, the uh, steroids, maybe Kerry took them, I don't know, but he certainly got a bill. Uh, and then it was permeating and then into other sports. Uh, Gino was... Uh, High liver, had a great looking apartment, went up to visit with him quite a bit. Went out with him to do a, a feature one night at a club, and it turned out we had to get out of there for our lives. It just, he was ready to fight everybody. He, he was just a good guy, but he just couldn't control anything. So they found him dead. And all the evidence, officially it was a suicide. Unofficially, and from everything we know, it was murder, owing drug dealers and all that stuff. It was a terrible time, really was. And uh, Chris involved in it, and he, sh you know, he was about my size. He should never been in wrestling, unless you want to <laughs> get hurt a lot. And, uh, and then Michael was into it after his operation and or his sickness. Yeah, it was a, it was a terrible time. Of a, of a job is it you being a broadcaster for wrestling to deal with so much of the talent that's uh, you know probably using all the time yeah. when, when you have to put them on camera or in the ring. I mean, is, is, it, is it a challenge? That, ignore it. You just ignore it. I mean, at the time that they were to be in the ring, if if they couldn't handle it, they couldn't come out there. Mm -hmm. uh, Kevin, could, I don't think Kevin really was on drugs much. Uh, he may have, but he had never thought, and I never thought David did. They claim he died of an overdose in, some of the people who know said he died of an overdose in Japan. Kerry was, 
you know, love Kerry. He was a great kid. And he'd give you a hug every time he saw you. But trying to do an interview with him was an act of faith. I'd go over it with him in the back. Now, Kerry, I'm going to ask you this question, okay? Here's what you want to say. Da, 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 da. Now, I'll ask you the question. Da, 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 da. And he'd say it. I said, okay, you got it? I think so. And then uh, I'd ask him, uh, here's the second question. And then before he came out to do the interview, I'd, do, I'd go over it again. And uh, not that he was on drugs, it's just, it's just he was a little slow on learning things. But all those things, uh, as, as far as, I would never mention and never had anything about stuff on the air. That was off limits. Uh, after, they, after some of the deaths and all that, we would talk about things, but not, not the fact of drugs or anything. So I just left that alone. That was one of the great things about world class that Mickey and I talked about. Mickey came up with the idea of doing little features. Nobody had done features on wrestlers. I mean, they were just wrestlers. You know, best two out of three falls for a long time. They don't do that anymore. So we decided that we'd have little features that would uh, show up what the people really like. And they would uh, usually be around the Von Erichs, of course, because Fritz, that's what he wanted to promote, the Von Erichs. And this one, I don't remember how they had a deal that whoever won the bout uh, had to, whoever lost the bout had to go and do something for the other guy. Well, of course, David was going to win. I'm sorry, but the, that's just the way it is sometimes. <laughs> and that was when Jimmy Garvin and Sunshine had to go out to the farm, the ranch, and pick up the hay and do all that stuff. <laughs> and we did those, and they were I loved them. I wish I had a, all of them. Uh, Sunshine had to leave because, you know, we've already been over that. And all of a sudden, here's Precious. And we say, who's Precious? Jimmy Garvey just brings in Precious one night. And we don't know who Precious is. And we keep this, we don't know, we don't know who Precious is. So uh, we decided we're going to go out and ask Jimmy Garvin who Precious is. So we take the video thing out there. And I knock on the door. And Precious comes to the door and opens the door and she's in it. I don't know what you call it, a little kind of nightgown, the, one of those modern things, you know, that doesn't re close much. Mm -hmm. And I said, hello. <laughs> and she said, can I help you? I said, well, you're precious, aren't you? Yes. Is Jimmy Garvin here? No. Close the door. <laughs> so then we, we had the storyline. We didn't know. And finally, that. Precious was his girlfriend, and uh, that it was his wife, really. But uh, the one I would really love to see is uh, David and I, because I had a horse when I was a kid, and they had horses. And I mentioned that to David one day, and he said, "Let's do a lot of those features on our horses." They had, and I said, "Okay, that'd be fine. I haven't ridden a horse in a long time." So we went out there, and they had these beautiful uh, horses. And uh, I got, uh, he and I have talked about horses and walked around, did the whole thing. Then we got on the horses and we were riding along and they started playing uh, Willie Nelson's Don't Let Your Boy Grow Up to Be Cowboys. And we were riding into the sunset. I mean, it was so Western and so beautiful. And I just, I wish I could find that somewhere, but I, somebody's got it, I don't know who has. And it was you and Mickey that kind of created these. Yeah, mm -hmm. and yeah. We we did a, try to do one a week if we could, or every other week or so. And of course, I got in with the Freebirds, and that was always a joke, because they would ask me to come to lunch. Uh, so we'd take the cameras out to the Sonic Drive-In or wherever. Never a really nice, <laughs> a fancy restaurant, just you know. And I'd come up, and uh, they were in the car having. They, they were, I was supposed to go to lunch with them. I said, what are you doing here? If I'm, you said for me to come to lunch. 
we just wanted to come out here and tell you some things. So I never went to lunch, really. I went out there to be in lunch, but I never got to lunch with them. And uh, all, all sorts of crazy stuff that we could think of. One of my, oh, let me tell you what, one of my, this was <laughs> Moondog Bane. He was a great deal on water, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, in fact, he, earlier on before uh, that, he had put a uh, garden hose around my neck to said, just remember, he didn't tighten it, he just put it around on an interview at the, at the, at the match and said, I just want you to put this around and remember that water flows through you and, and water is what keeps you going. I said, okay, okay, well don't, <laughs> and Fritz made an edict, do not put anything around the announcer. <laughs> but we went out to, so they, so they got it set up some way. We had the first water slide. You, you look at it and wonder, will that thing stand up? And he was going to be there, we were going to interview him sitting in the water, in the water slide. And typically, I'm dressed in a sport coat and tie. And I'm so we go up and I interview him. I'm sitting by the pool, leaning down, or, and uh, he's like, as you are close. And we talk, and I said, well, thanks much. And he reaches over, grabs me, and pulls me into the water pool. And I, <laughs> I had no idea what was going to happen. And uh, I took the mic off, and I thought I might be electrocuted. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, we're going we're to take the ride of your life. And he pushed me down the slide head first. <laughs> and after that, then, the, the crew said, well, listen, to make this really good, we're going to have to move the camera down a couple of spots so we can get you going by. Right. So I had to go down two more times. <laughs> and it, it was a great one. You know, another one that a lot of people talk about and remember is when uh, Kamala actually pushed you down. <laughs> I saw Kamala at a reunion a few years ago, and he came over. I'm so sorry I pushed you down that day. Mm -hmm. I said, hey, it's over. It worked out well. Yeah, that was, that was the, uh, one of the rivers in the Congo. Uh, and uh, we had flown over there to, <laughs> to interview Kamala. And it was kind of an accident. I was leaning. I had stepped over and kind of started back, and somehow the, the whole thing was truly an accident. But he pushed me, and I fell over into the weeds. <laughs> and that got a lot the of response. Of the Congo. Yeah, <laughs> right in the Congo. We didn't know it at the time, but Doris. Uh, was concerned about the boys all doing wrestling, but figured that out later. And when David died, uh, I spent more time with him then than I guess I'd ever spent. You know, we'd see each other at the sportatorium or at some banquet or something. But she was, uh, he was very strong. David and her had died, and she demanded that they go down and see the body. And they didn't embalm the body over in Japan, or if they did, it was a, not well done. And everybody told her, you're not going to want to see this, you know. And I, but she went. Uh, as all of this developed, she stayed strong for the other kids. But finally, at the end, she just uh, blamed Fritz for the, the whole thing. And then they got a divorce. I had a friend who was a professor of psychiatry at the University of North Texas, and he studied uh, suicides. We'd had a rash of plain old high school students killing themselves. I mean, like a rash, six or seven in a year. Uh, it was just terrible. And then along come the Von Erichs. And we talked about what had happened. And he said, I don't understand how they managed to have any sanity after all that. It, one, one suicide in a family can destroy the whole thing and, or, you know, and make it so difficult. 
and somebody blamed somebody all the time. And he never quite understood how that all could, could play out. And I guess she held it in as long as she could. And, and uh, they built that big home in East Texas. And uh, finally, when the last one went, uh, she went. It was really, you know, she'd lost her first son up in Detroit, mm -hmm. stepping on an electrical cord. That was really an accident. Well, she lost all of them but one. And Kevin, Kevin uh, was a good guy. I need, I see his kids are wrestling now. Yeah, yeah they're, uh, they're starting out. They're starting out with Harley Race. Yeah. Oh, Harley. That was, uh, David won his first match with Harley Race. That's right. The, uh, it was, that wasn't in Texas, that was in St. Louis though, wasn't it? Well, he had one in Texas too. You know, you never knew where they ran the next time. But he beat Harley in Texas to make his name, at least locally. When, uh, when David passed, why do you think uh, they chose Kerry over Kevin? I don't know. I do not know because Kevin's the oldest. And I guess, I just don't know. I can't read Fritz's mind. We didn't know why. Uh, Kevin had the physique, looked great, you know, and all that. But I think, I think Kevin was a natural choice. Uh, Kevin and I had a long conversation one time, and I'm going to use this. All, it, was, it was never off the record. It was just that we were talking and doing an interview while walking across the football stadium. And he told me that, he asked me, he said, he said, you're a father and a grandfather. And I said, yeah. He said, is it all right not only to love your father but to hate him too? Maybe you've heard that before. And I said, you know, I'm sure, yeah, it's okay. I mean, we're just people. We just happen to be your father, and you get mad at us. And you, He said, yeah, but, he said, he, Fritz cheated us out of money. And he wouldn't uh, put us on the, the lead in the card and other things and other things and other things. So they had a terrible business relationship with their father. Uh, and, you know, I didn't go into that much, but uh, I don't know why he didn't use Kevin. To me, Kevin was, uh, you know, David, Kevin, and then Mick, uh, uh, Kerry came along. But, uh, man, I, I pushed the heck out of Kevin. I liked the way he, he flew around the ring. I called him the barefoot boy uh, with tan. <laughs> and... and uh, it just, it just seemed something could, uh, Fritz had, and he controlled them. He controlled the whole thing. They didn't have a voice. David left him for a while, you, you remember. Mm -hmm. He went to Florida, decided to get away. He didn't, didn't like some things going on. He didn't like the way it was run. He took off and went to Florida and worked. And I think with Kiyomuka, I believe, or somebody down there. And that was a little bit of a dicey thing. We didn't mention anything about it that we, all we mentioned was that he was a uh, so important wrestler that they asked him to come to Florida mm -hmm. and, and then he came back. Yeah, and I think that was business. We thought that David would take over the business. He was the most uh, dynamic. He also had good ideas, like helped out with those features that we did. Uh, and we thought, okay, at some point, when Fritz retires, David will be the man to take it over, and it, it would probably still go. And it might, you know, it might have still been going, except for all the drugs and things that happened. We, in trying to deal with Fritz, and we may be losing it some here, but it, it, he was difficult to, to be with. I worked for him for a number of years and never got a raise. <laughs> The cost of living went up, but I didn't get a cost of living raise. We went to, we were the four most popular people in Israel on TV. 
they decided to take, to go over there, take uh, Fritz, Kevin, and Carrie, I guess. And we said, take us. Take Bill and a cameraman. Let's do a show there. No, we don't want to do that. And we said, why? Well, you know, may, may, up, may upset the people in Jordan, may upset the people in, in uh, Lebanon or whatever, because we're in Israel shooting a show. So they didn't want to do that. Although they shot a show in Israel. I don't think it ever showed here, but they did it in Israel. Then we tried to get him to take the show on the road. Just take us all. They went some places, I think. But we said, let's, let's go out, make a big deal about coming into uh, Orlando or Miami. Or, but you're running into somebody else's territory. Well, pick the place that doesn't have a big territory then. He didn't do that. He was more interested in his shows in Dallas, Austin, San Antonio, well, San Antonio, and out west, Amarillo, and Yeah, the thing was growing so big, you know. I walk into Las Vegas to do a basketball game with my friends um, I'm at, from North Texas. We're out there doing North Texas and University of Nevada, Las Vegas. So we go into, a, into a, one of these places, you know, uh, I guess a casino, to have some coffee and get something to eat. And reporter, SID, and another reporter and I were all there. The waiter comes up and he looks around, he looks at me and says, God, you're the wrestling announcer. <laughs> and my friends just fell out laughing. We can't go anywhere with him. We can't take him anywhere. He gets, he's known all over the country, in Jacksonville, Florida, and every, you know, everywhere. <laughs> and uh, so there was, there was a way to do that where it would have been a huge success, I think. But and no one other than Fritz really, uh, none of his sons really wanted to, I guess, step up too much to. They couldn't do it. He ran it. I mean, he was. They may have asked him, but he was not going to do it. So it, it it never happened. But it did happen on the syndication. Ron Chapman, my friend at KVIL, who was a morning disc jockey, and that's when I worked with him, went on a honeymoon. <laughs> he comes back and he said. I'm on my honeymoon. We go to England. I walk in the, this beautiful hotel. And typically, I turn on the TV and flop down on the bed. I'm looking at it. And who comes on the TV? World class championship wrestling and Bill Mercer. I got to travel all the way to England to see you. <laughs> oh, Lord. It was a great era, you know, of us. And talk locally about at the height of world class what that meant to Dallas specifically. It was a, a, a rebirth of the wrestling genre. We had people, we had SMU students, TCU students coming out there. We had a radio station that started picking up the broadcast, an FM station. Uh, we had people dressing up again, wearing suits and, and clothes, you know, uh, that uh, were pretty high style for a wrestling match in those days. It just, uh, and everybody talked about it. I'd be on the air at KVIL and they'd call and want to talk to me about wrestling. And, uh, so it was, it, was, it was amazing how that had a long time, it was just there. But then this thing hit and it was just a great impact. But wrestling always had a secret audience. Mm -hmm. I had a great uh, internist doctor, and Dr. Bass, and uh, my wife, and I went to him. So Eileen comes home one day and she said, I don't know if we can go to Dr. Bass anymore. I said, why? He says that after he does his rounds on Saturday, he goes home, puts on a bathrobe, sits down and watches wrestling. <laughs> 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 and he told me, he said, it's the best I've ever, it's the greatest drama and fun and I can just relax. <laughs> it was an undercurrent of people that always watch it. Can you talk about what Gary Hart, uh, when he was, was booking for Fritz, how, 
how important he was to the territory and the success? He really was because he knew where everybody, <laughs> he was like a politician, he knew where everybody was. And he knew how to finagle them to come in, you know. And Fritz never was going to pay the greatest salary he ever did. But he was the one who kept bringing in the talent. And we weren't in the NWA anymore, so we didn't have that circuit. So you had to go out and get the best you could bet. And we had those Thanksgiving shows at the Reunion Arena, 20,000 people, Christmas, Christmas Day afternoon at Reunion Arena in Dallas, we had a show and it filled up the place. And, and Gary really was the one who took care of filing, finding the guys, bringing them in, knew which ones to use in which situation, like a Duke Kiyomuka, who became <laughs> uh, kind of a password around town. Everybody was kind of, because I don't mean Kiyomuka, uh, uh, gosh, Kiyomuka was way before that. Well, I'll think of it in a minute. Uh, anyway, it was Gary Hart's Japanese wrestler friend. Was you talking about Tojo Yamamoto or? Um, no. Uh, oh, Kabuki. Kabuki, the great yeah. Kabuki, great yes, Kabuki. yeah. Who spit green all over me one day. <laughs> <laughs> but he was, he, Gary just knew how to, how to promote it and how to bring down the right guys. How about when uh, they, they changed Booker's from Gary Hart to Johnny Mantel? Do you have any? Was there, was there a big difference or a big uh, change? Well, in the everything was going down then. And, uh, you know, those guys had good sized egos, and Gary did, and they were going to have a new, a new venture, and there just wasn't anybody. And with all the Von Eric situation problems, the promotion was going downhill anyway. And it wasn't, there was no way, nobody would come in. And then they sold. Uh, all the contracts to Oklahoma City or someplace. So it, it, it just went away. I tried to hang around for a while, and they, but they didn't know how to do the shows, and it didn't work out. Do you think it was a mistake on their end to break away from the NWA when they did? Uh, I think so. The uh, NWA provided, before, before uh, World Class, you know, we'd always had somebody coming in uh, one of the champions, somebody would, you know, come in and, and it set up a contest around that circuit of Fritz's. Whoever could win got a chance to meet the famous whoever. And uh, it worked really well, we drew crowds. But after, after that dropped off, it was hard to get people to come in there because, again, Fritz wasn't like to pay a lot. And uh, there wasn't that competition anymore. So I thought at the time it was a, a bad decision. Uh, you know how we got into the NWA back in, in Dallas? How so? Well, the Sportatorium, the original Sportatorium burned. And uh, they built a new one. And the NWA was working at that time. It's in my book. <laughs> it was working that time, and down in Austin, uh, Houston, <coughs> they had NWA. And it got, it got to be a real tussle between uh, Dallas and the, not, and the NWA people. And uh, that was uh, before the burning of the And they had another fire then at the new Sportatorium. And, uh, and they signed up. And another promoter came in at Dallas before the fire. And so there was a lot of pressure and uh, a lot of people got hurt physically before uh, Ed McLemore signed on with the NWA. Ed was a great businessman, a neat guy, you know, really a but uh, he got the message. <laughs> the, fire didn't, the fire didn't destroy the new sportatorium as much as uh, the old one, but he got the message. Ah, uh, Percy, yeah. 
Percy was like a uh, Hollywood character in those 1940 movies, you know. Uh, the guy that nobody, no girl wants, but he's always trying to, uh, by his suave nature and, and uh, his vocabulary, was trying to convince people, you know, to marry him or something. I've seen those people in old movies so much. And Percy was, we had a great name, Percy, for one thing. That he was, he was a dandy. He was that, uh, one of many. The, uh, you know, we briefly talked about uh, both of these guys, but just about uh, Gino Hernandez and Chris Adams. And, and oh, Chris, I forgot Chris. I interviewed Chris uh, when he came to America or came down here to wrestle in Dallas. We had tea out at a, <laughs> and, and we sat there and had tea. And he was the nicest person, had that beautiful English accent then. And he was a, a great uh, star in England, he and his brother. His brother was an Olympic star. And uh, so Chris came in and, you know, people in Texas don't like to admit it, but they love English accents. And, <laughs> and the women just went crazy over Chris. And he and I became really good friends. And, uh, but his life spiraled down and down. It just seemed to go along with the rest of them. And basically alcohol with him, but I suppose some drugs. And he became brutal when he got drunk, beat up his wife or his girlfriend, beat up that co-pilot on the plane, they went to prison and taught guys in prison how to be wrestlers. <laughs> he was, he was, uh, I, I really liked him and we tried to work with him later on with some stuff, but it, it, he just was with the wrong people and uh, then all of a sudden they have this thing and walks a hatchet and he's shot and killed. I mean, it just, how much, how much can one area take of people dying like that? It's, uh, you know, a lot of people refer to it as the curse of world class. Yeah, it could have been, I guess. It could have been because it was like some blooming, well, like what I thought. It bloomed up into something we used to describe it and then the bloom died. And uh, with it, all these people died. Gino, as we've already mentioned, probably was murdered. Chris was murdered. Uh, my good friend, uh, that I had on that group, uh, Killer Carl Cox, uh, just, he and I always got along well, and he always used me. He'd walk into the sportatorium, and of course, all he had to do was walk in and the place went nuts. But he would come down about halfway down and I was up in this cat thing up above of the ring in the area. He'd come down and he'd look up at me. And I was, <laughs> and I was, I would start smiling and he would look up at me and he'd say, and, and like, I'll get you. And then he'd turn around and stop to the ring and people throw beer on him and uh, it was awful. But he was, you know, what a, a lot of fun he was to be around outside the ring. Yeah. That's good, uh, because the Freebirds were totally different than the Von Erichs who had this uh, appearance of the, the great kids that could do no harm, you know, do no wrong. They were the, the beautiful, my wife used to say, I'm just going to sit here and watch the Von Erics come in, then I'm going to do something else. When they had marched in in their right. beautiful coats, you know. And then there were the Freebirds. <laughs> a bunch of guys, much like the old uh, uh, characters in the movies way, way back when they began, you know, a bunch of guys that didn't fit together. Uh, and were just enormously inept and apt. <laughs> They were, they had, uh, you know, I can't even remember all their names right now, but the uh, the smaller one. Buddy Roberts? Yeah, Roberts. Uh, he was like somebody always trying to do something and make a mess of it, like uh, Abbott and Costello. Costello's always making a mess of whatever, and he was that guy. And he had this attitude that he was brilliant and beautiful, and... Uh, 
they, they just, uh, they were amazing. But they were so opposite to Von Erichs that it really worked. You know, just really worked well. And uh, we'd take, uh, we'd take all, uh, go out and shoot them as much as we did on features. Yeah, they, they were fantastic. Uh, let's see, uh, Gordy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Went over. You may have seen this tape, but we went over to talk to him about some bout that Gordy threw himself on this asphalt driveway and spun himself around on his back, yelling about he's going to kill so and so and mutilate so and so. And uh, it was just totally opposite of what uh, the Von Erichs, the great gentlemen, were going to have to endure. You know, yeah, they were wild. They were really wild. Uh, as I said, I'd go to lunch, but they wouldn't buy my lunch, and I'd just sit at the table with them. Buy your own lunch. Well, you invited me. No, we didn't. You thought you you came over to talk to us. <laughs> they were they were totally dishonest. You know, if you want to, they, these are just terms. Mm -hmm. uh, rascals. Uh, they'd do anything to win about, and uh, they were just totally opposite. It was wonderful to have them around. Do you think there's anybody else that could have played the, the foil as well as they did? With no, the no, I, I can't think of anybody. Uh, individually, there were some guys, you know, but not, not that group. That group was wonderful. Do you watch any wrestling now? No. When's the last time you've actually ever watched a wrestling program? Whew. I can't remember. I just don't like all the flamboyance and all the craziness that's going on. We, I, I, I've gotten older. I don't. <laughs> I can't visualize that as being uh, what we what wrestling was or what what wrestling should be. It's a the entertainment factor. I guess is great. I don't know if there's a storyline in there anywhere, but uh, I've just glanced at it going by and kept going because. Whew. And all the old wrestling fans that when I sit, we in Dallas and see me, I don't like this new stuff. They're all related to what we had, you know. But I'm sure this stuff is great. When you think back about your career, do you, do you think yourself as a, as a wrestling announcer or is that just a small part of it? That was a small part. It was a part, as I said, a hobby. Mm -hmm. And it was fun to go over to Fort Worth on Saturday night or Friday night and do the shows and, you know, come back. Somebody edited them, so I put them on. That was all we did. Or when it was Sportatorium, when I was in Dallas. Uh, and I don't know that I ever really watched after they started taping them. I guess sometimes I would watch it just to see how things worked out. At WCCW, world class, we watched them to, to gauge what we were trying to do. But those are the, probably the last ones I ever really watched. Um, I never uh, thought of myself, as I, I told my students at the University of North Texas, I said, now, you know my background, uh, I'm also done wrestling. And I would tell you, I don't think it's a good career path to being a sportscaster. <laughs> because people look down their nose at, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. at that. And, you know, I don't know why, because, God, they go out, do the Olympics, and they got all sorts of crazy stuff in that. All these shows now, that, you know, that uh, these reality shows, which are so phony, I don't know how anybody wastes the time with them. But uh, our show was real. I mean, I tell them, look, Chris Adams hit uh, Kevin Bonnery with a steel chair in the ring in the Cotton Bowl, 20,000 people watching. And I was sitting down by the ring like this, and blood ran down the apron and down onto my desk and on down. I said, so when they had blood, they made it, and he hit him with a steel chair. Now maybe you didn't intend to hit him that hard, but you know. So it, it's just something I enjoyed doing, and uh, I guess I'd do it again if I were younger. <laughs> if they do it our way, you know. Uh, 
we went to Green Bay the day before, and it was really nice. I mean, 35, 40, 30 degrees or whatever it was, it was nice up there, you know, nice winter, fresh air. And a couple of reporters and I walked around town uh, looking at the place and had dinner, and then we came back to the hotel. So I had a call <clears throat> for, I don't remember, 6.37, and the phone rang, I picked it up. And said, Good morning, welcome to Green Bay, Wisconsin. It's 6.35 or 7 o'clock, and it's 35 degrees below zero outside. And that hits you like, huh? <laughs> what? 30, 35 degrees. And I put the phone down, I said, 35 below? It can't have happened over that. So I put on my clothes and went down and had a swinging door and near the restaurant. And I walked in a swinging door, walked outside, and went right on around. The wind was blowing, and it was just icicles went right through your body. You know? So we went in and had dinner, uh, breakfast, and I said, what are we going to do? What are they going to do? Surely they're not going to play a game with 35 below zero. Now it'll be below zero when we start. And lo and behold, they did. I had forgotten my gloves. <laughs> I had my overcoat. I wore a suit, of course, had an overcoat and a hat, but I didn't have gloves. Carrying my briefcase and stuff, had to walk from the bus over to uh, the dressing rooms across the stadium and up the, into Lam the old Lambeau. And they had a, a press box then that was, <clears throat> you could see them today in high school stadiums, you know, where they're kind of white mm -hmm. and they got all the windows across. And it was that kind of a, and the radio booth was about six or, maybe six or eight feet deep. And they had two windows. And the three of us were going to be in there. I was the announcer. Uh, Blackie Sherrod was the color guy. And then we had a uh, spotter. So we're standing around, and somebody said, uh, I just got coffee, and it's frozen. And by then, it was 20 below or something. And I looked at the windows. I always liked to work with the windows open, but they were frozen shut. And we were standing there talking, and all of a sudden look up, and they're all glazed over with ice. And I said, we can't see. <laughs> Out of this, call game when you can't see. You can't see through this. So the spotter was a guy from Green Bay, a uh, young guy. He said, well, that's OK. I'll go get some uh, windshield de-icer. Be right back. So he took off across <laughs> the parking lot and the snow-covered fields. And about 30 minutes later, he came back. His face was bright red. He was so cold, I thought he was going to die. And he brought us th three bottles of uh, cans of windshield de-icer. That saved our life, that windshield the ice room, because every, we'd spray it on and it'd work, and then after a while we'd have to spray it on again. And it, it was just so cold, it was unbelievable. Uh, I just kept my hands in my pockets. Of, I, I, what I used then was spotty boards I made out of some, uh, kind of board-like material, and I put the spotty boards in uh, paper and stuck them on there. So I had those two sitting up. And uh, so I could keep, remind myself if I went blank, like I did with the Freebirds a moment ago, who was who was who. And uh, I knew the Cowboys, but you never, every now and then you look at it and say that, uh, uh, Walt Garrison, or, well, you know, you. So that was what the spotter was doing for the Green Bay. Uh, we had no coffee, no water, nothing. There was no heat in there. The day before, uh, Lombardi had given all the media a tour. They put a new heating system in below the surface of the uh, field. And he said, no problem. Boy, it gets cold here. We just turn the heating system on, and it feels nice and soft and all that. I walked across that field that day going to the press box. It was hard as a tabletop, hard as a rock. And I had invited the engineer who designed it for them to come up and interview at halftime. <laughs> he never showed up. <laughs> the, Probably wasn't his proudest moment. No, that, that system failed dramatically, as did everything else, you know. No band playing, 
No whistles with the referees. We just had to follow hand signs. And fortunately, I had one of the best color guys I've ever had in Blackie Sherrod, who was one of the preeminent uh, sports columnists in the country. He talked very little, but what he said something, it was important. And uh, we really had a good time together. That was a confound. Uh, yeah, it, I didn't listen to that game for years because I thought I was so cold, it must have been a terrible broadcast, that I must have been shaking or whatever. But at the beginning of the broadcast, when I finally did I, we said, okay, it's 20 below or whatever it was at the time, or 20, uh, and Blackie and I both said, we're not going to talk about the weather anymore. Here's what the weather is. The field is frozen. And no band, because they can't touch their lips to the instruments. The people look like they're <laughs> frozen dummies out there, but the place is packed. And we're just going to talk about the game, and you'll have to remember that it's cold, because we don't want to mention the cold over and over again. And that's what we did. Actually, the broadcast was pretty good. And uh, I was really surprised when I finally... I just, one of those things where you're sure that you... Because it was so bad, physically that you're sure that the product you put out was not going to be me. Did you even think at the time that this might be a, a game they talk about 40 years later? No. I mean, it was, it was a great game, you know. I mean, really, it was, considering everything, it was really a fine football game. And uh, then the ending, of course, just went blah. But uh, Bob Hayes <laughs> never took his hands out of his pockets that day in his pants. Ran around with his hands in his pants. <laughs> it just didn't fit with his uh, feelings. But there were some great plays, you know. Meredith drops back, flips it out in the flat to Danny Reeves. Reeves falls a long pass down the left sideline. It's caught by whoever it was, and got in with a touchdown. And I listened to that, and I said, well, damn, that was a good call. <laughs> That was a very good call, considering everything. Could even hear the teeth chattering. Oh, yeah. And poor Meredith, uh, we got back on the team plane. He sat in front of me. I sat in the back with the players. And he, he got so emotional, he started crying. And he says, it's my fault. I let you guys down. It's my fault. I should have played better. I should have done more. And I don't know. I was sitting and putting my hands on his shoulders. Said, Don, it was a great game. Only the survivor's going to win that thing. And the other players came over and hugged him. And he was such an emotional guy at times, such a wonderful person. He was one of my all-time favorites, he and Drysdale and Killer Cox. <laughs>
I then had to go over my spotting board and change all the stats that I penciled in by each player's name. So uh, Bob Hayes, uh, 35 catches and 250, uh, whatever, you know. Uh, a niece of mine came by one day when I was working on the stats. I covered him up with a little paper stick, you know, and I put a paper over those stats, another stat, another stat. She said, what are you doing, Uncle Bill? Covering up your mistakes? <laughs> and I said, yes, yeah, sort of like that. Uh, basketball, but I've spent an uh, equal amount of time. Uh, then I had to also be, work on, I was doing North Texas at the same time I was doing the Cowboys, so that was working those in. But I always uh, told my students, you have, you've got to do a lot of preparation. And preparation is the key to being a good broadcaster. Uh, basketball, I had spotting sheets for that because you don't get the, uh, if you're doing college basketball like we did then, on radio only, uh, you don't get the next team's uh, roster and starting lineup until the day of the game. Nobody sent that early in those days. We didn't have uh, computers, so we just so you you get that a couple of days or the day of, the day before the game, and then make a spotting board for the new basketball team. I did that because again, you're trying to catch up, and you got to be a little behind it especially for their team, but you have to identify people in places where there's no identification. The near wing, the near corner, the baseline, uh, the middle of the court, the free throw line, uh, all that is not on there for you to see like it is in football, you know, the yard line and all that. So that's a big problem with basketball, plus it does move fast. And baseball was my, <laughs> my favorite because, ah, baseball. Ah, oh, we're going home, you know. <laughs> and uh, I, of course, I grew up with baseball, Mesa, and uh, love that game. Still do. Still try to do so with my friend out in Austin. But it's so personal, and you spend so many, many days, 160 days, with those players, and you know them inside and out. That you know them, but you, some stuff you don't use, of course, but. You have to, uh, that's a daily thing. And that's, and baseball, no matter if you have a day off, it's still, you work every day. Because you're catching up on stats, uh, you're inter getting ready to interview somebody, you're making stories up, you're finding out what's going on in, in the league. And Major League Baseball is just tons of information that you have to disseminate. Back when I started doing uh, AAA baseball with KRLD in 1959, we were lucky to get any stats from the other team or our own stats. Batting average. If you could get a batting average. And I recreated those out of town games then, you know, Western Union Wire or later on other means. So that I, I, I just have to kind of not make it up, but really embellish a lot of stuff. And uh, it was, recreation was, was my game. And I could use and build and. I used to drive the owner crazy in Muskogee. We rarely won, it seemed, but when we're on the road and they're winning like a one-run lead in the ninth inning and the home team's batting in the last half of the ninth inning, and I'd have, here's the pitch, a swung on a foul, a fly ball, hit deep to right field, going back as a right fielder to the wall, and he makes the catch at the wall. <laughs> I got in trouble with that when guys would call their wives and say, God, you just, Barely got the, what? That was just a little pop-up in right field. <laughs> and the owner would call me and say, just drive me crazy. You just drive me crazy. Yeah, but that was- a lot of fun with radio than uh, with TV. Oh, a lot of more fun, yeah. And uh, I, uh, I always told my students, you have to get out there two hours early. What? Two hours early? Okay, you got line. You got to check your line. In these days of radio, and, uh, not everything is set today, I guess. But we still have fallouts, even in television. So you have to get there early enough to be sure the line is in and that it works. Because if you, if it doesn't work or it's not in, you've got to try to get in touch with the phone company, which you have called early in the week to order the line, 
but then you don't have really confidence in the telephone company. And so you get there, and then you're calling the telephone company again. My line is not in. What line? <laughs> so you've got to figure out a way. I almost got in a fight in Memphis one time because I couldn't find my line. It was wasn't up in the press box. They had that new stadium, that big, very high stadium. So I got out in the, in the press area and talked to the SID, and he said, well, so they put something over here in one of the, one of the, by one of the tables. And I went over, there was my telephone line, down in the, the reporter's area. And I said, well, God, I guess I'll just have to do the game here. And the reporter said, you're not going to do the game down here. I said, who says I'm not? And so we kind of, you know, all right. And so the SID steps in. He says, I tell you what you do, Bill. I've got a, a big roll of long cable. You attach it to, to this outlet here and crawl out on the, <laughs> take it up to the next level, and I'll hand it to you out on this catwalk. I said, I'm 5,000 feet above the field. Yeah, I, I don't like height. And he said, well, you, you can run that. So I got out on the catwalk. It's about this wide. And I don't look down. And I carry it over. I'm taking this cable over to the booth, put it in there, set it up, and that's the kind of stuff you had to put up with. And, you know, it all is preparation, 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 preparation. And I watched some TV today. I won't, I won't go into it because I'm, I do get awfully uh, irritated about it. They're doing TV, but they don't tell you who's got the who's doing what with the ball, on uh, basketball. They just stop talking as a play and just running on the offensive end. And there are people handling the ball. You don't have to tell them where the ball is because you can see it, but you kind of like to know who's playing, right? I don't know Kansas State's players, no Duke's players, but, and they don't, they won't follow the play, a lot of these people. They just quit talking or they talk about something else. And I think, the idea of being a sportscaster is to inform people. The radio people are blind. I got a story about that. And I told my students, they're blind, they can't see it. So you have to go in detail, detail, detail. And that means you have to identify the players as they move the ball and back and forth. So TV's got the idea, oh, they can see it, so we don't have to tell them anything. It drives me crazy. When I first started in this business and I was Typical young announcer, is this the right thing I should do? And I'd been doing the uh, Dallas-Fort Worth team that for 59 for a while. And I get a letter from this, and this young man writes, I really enjoy your broadcast. I listen to them when you're on the road, that's my recreations, and I can see every play, which I thought, okay, I'm doing that right. I can see all the plays, I can see the players, I can see the, uh, Distances on the field. And then when you come back to Burnett Field, which was the old baseball park in Dallas, I go to the game and I take my radio with me and I listen to it and listen to you describe it. Even though I'm blind, I can still see the game. I said, okay, this is worth doing. This is worth doing. And radio people are blind. And a blind person comes to a game with my radio and listens and he can still see the game. And so that's, that's what I feel about it. And I can't, as many hours as I've spent in my life, I'm like a son about that, uh, and, and days, and it, it just hurts me when I hear broadcasts that are so bad today that they don't do anything. They don't talk about the people who are doing the game. And that's what it's all about. You know, that's, and particularly radio, they can't see it, so we have to describe it carefully. And boy, it's, uh, I taught that for 30 years, North Texas, and... Uh, but you won't get any of your students doing that. Oh, if I can, no, they don't do it. I, if they, <laughs> but I have caught them when they ask me to listen to a tape or something. They'll forget, but I would forget things too, because nobody critiqued me. I was always the announcer, so I couldn't do no wrong, but I did. And I didn't critique, well, we didn't tape things in those days. You know. So they do now, and they send it to me. 
or they just sent it by uh, email, and I listened to it, and I said, you forgot to give the score. You remember, you give the score after every basket attempted and every basket made, and the time, because you got 10 seconds from the time the basket's made, they bring the ball in, you got 10 seconds before they have to take it. That's the time you give the score, and the time, and all that. But getting up into the drama of it and the emotion of it, sometimes you just forget to do it. So I, I really, uh, you know, that was the way we did it. Would, would your life as an announcer been a lot easier if you operated in today's world with the computer stats basically oh. hand, handed to you every day and the, yeah. everything pre-wired? Yeah, it would have been a lot easier. Uh, but you know, it was, it's the kind of thing you lived with at the time and tried to handle the best way you could. And uh, it was always, it seemed to, it was always something. The lines or the no stats or no this and, and uh, but it well, was I, fun. I wanted to ask you, I saw your website, so you still do uh, consulting today yeah. for somebody yeah. who wants a critique. How would, if somebody wanted to, uh, I guess get evaluated by Bill Mercer, what would they do? Well, all they got to do is look on uh, Bill Mercer's uh, sports clinic, and uh, I have the whole thing laid out on how, uh, what I would do. Uh, you send me a tape, or send me a CD, or whatever, or email of a play-by-play. -play. If you're a young kid, uh, colleges have quit doing this. North Texas doesn't have my course really working anymore. Other colleges, uh, I don't think North Carolina has a course. I looked over at some of the others. Uh, my partner and I are trying to have, get uh, Texas State College down in San Marcos. They want to use us to finish off their students before they graduate because nobody ever critiques them. So go to Bill Mercer Sports Clinic, uh, dot com, or, and uh, the website is there. It explains how, what I'm planning to do. Uh, I've had a kid from Mississippi that I've been working with, and uh, you do this, and he would send me his play-by-play -play on email. I'd listen to it. I'd send him a lengthy critique back, <laughs> highlighted, and he was pretty bad uh, in basketball, and we got better, and he got better, and finally one day I listened to it, and I said, he's got it. He is a broadcaster, you know because now he uses everything. I had a young man several years ago, was a friend of my uh, optometrist, ophthalmologist. So anyway, this guy was going to UCLA or USC and, and was doing uh, independent baseball out on the West Coast. So the doctor told me, he said, would you, would if we tell him or give you his name, would you call him and tell him to send him some stuff? I said, sure. He said, okay, we're going to tell him you're going to call. So I called him. He said, okay. I said, I'll, uh, I'll send it to you. He said, okay. Independent baseball. I sit there, and uh, here's the pitch. Line drive. Base hit. Where? <laughs> Guy runs to second. What? I mean, it was just the most disjointed mess. So I listened to the whole game, and he said, and I started making highlight, you know, again on the critique. Base hit, where? Right field, center field, left field, down the line, to the fence, and, and ground ball in the infield. He would just say, ground ball in the infield, runners are safe at first. Ground ball to whom? Shortstop, third base, in between, into left field. And it's all this detail, detail, detail. And I sent him that, it must have been three or four pages, and uh, so I thought, I'll wait a while, because he's going to have to work at it. So I'll wait, I guess, four weeks. I tuned him in night and day. He did everything I told him. Everything. It was like he'd been born <laughs> doing it. I've never had anybody took my critique that seriously. And really, had so I met him two years ago this summer at a baseball meeting in Dallas. Big old guy, Josh Feldman's his name. He came up to me and he hugged me and he said, 
man, you saved my life. He was doing double uh, A ball then. And uh, he said, I, you know what I do? I take that critique, and every time I go into a booth, I puff it on the wall and check to be sure I'm doing it right. It's a guy dedicated. And you have to really be dedicated, because it, it's a lot of work. People don't understand that. If they're watching these TV games, those people don't do any work <laughs> that, I, that I'm criticizing. But uh, radio guys can't afford to be that lackadaisical. You know, I mean, it, it's just too much responsibility. It's not your game. It's their game. It's not me. It's the team. I'm the conduit, and I'm, my listeners are the ones that have to be able to see it in their mind. You know, it's just beautiful when it's done right. Kurt Gowdy, good night. 80 years old or older, and still doing it every week, all by himself, sealed off. He doesn't want, and that's the thing about it. They got too many analysts. <laughs> I'm against analysts. You can do baseball by yourself, and it's wonderful. I did it. God, how many years did I do it? Uh, three, about 10 years by myself. And I did recreations by myself, where all I got is a piece of paper. I had a picture of the ballpark in front of me, and that's it. But, you know, it's just, it's just something that's, I don't know where it's gone. They hired, one, one major league team has hired a guy who did not know how to pronounce Bill McKechnie. Bill McKechnie, great catcher. Played in Cincinnati, but he didn't know how to pronounce his name. Uh, no, you can't do that. If you got any question in your mind about a pronunciation or something, you got to ask. If you say, "I think it's broadcast," I think it's pronounced this way. Well, <laughs> Polish names—you're never sure about Polish names. So you go to the guys' the houses every game. You go down and talk to the coach. How are these pronunciations? Pronunciations. And uh, kids now with these names that they come up with, doing women's basketball or men's basketball, you've got to be sure because it looks like something, but you're not quite sure. So this is what happens every time, all the games. And it, it doesn't seem like work anymore. It just seems like, oh, this is what we have to do. And kind of like doing it. I don't know what I'm going to do when I die. <laughs> I'm going to miss it. <laughs>
the secrets of wrestling, or did they try to keep you? Oh, they told me. They, they would, and I, because they knew I wouldn't even tell anybody. Uh, that must have been something that uh, maybe some of your contemporaries in other sports probably asked you a lot about. Right? Oh, yeah. Uh, if you only had a nickel for every time they asked you, is wrestling real? Is wrestling yeah. Real? Uh, my son, Evan, who I live here with, went with me to do, uh, when I went down to do an interview with Baron Raschke, mm -hmm. Baron von Raschke. And, you know, he's a great big guy. He went to Michigan, I think, or university, and we were talking about that, and my son said, did you study ra uh, acting so you could be in this business, you know? And he laughed. He said, no, no don't study any acting. Uh, well, it was studio wrestling. And uh, we had the big studio, and down the hall then was the loading dock, and then the upstairs there was a, a kind of a place they had big couches in there so people could go rest when they did live shows way back before that time. So we're getting ready to start the, you know, 15 minutes before the bout starts, and I haven't seen anybody. And the director said, why don't you run back there and tell them we're about ready. So I walked back there. Here's a wrestler lying on the floor. There's one lying in the stairway and one up on top. And they all gotten in a fight <laughs> and knocked each other out. <laughs> It was, and I came back and said, they're all knocked out. <laughs> well, we waited around until they all returned to normal and went back and they didn't, normal, whatever that is with them. Yeah. I got to tell you one more story and you can keep it or not. You mentioned Gary Hart. He and, and Killer are probably my best friends of rascals that I knew in, in wrestling. Now, Gary Hart, you know, was injured and had a bad leg and and he was being the manager. So one day they decide somebody, I guess Fritz did, or maybe Gary did, he's going to have a bout with Fritz von Erich in Dallas at the Sportatorium. And I was talking to him. I said, what are you doing? You getting in the ring with Fritz? Yeah. Uh, I, this was, I said, who thought this up? And he said, well, well, you know, it's a big seller. Gary Hart, the great manager, is coming back and battled Fritz von Erich. Yeah, well, I, I hope you don't get killed. <laughs> so we go to the bout that night, no, the week before, and we're going to do a promotion interview. Uh, unfortunately, it was taped. I wish it had been live, because had it had been live, it would have been, I might have gotten fired or somebody would, but anyway. It's mentioned in the, the, the video of the documentary, but anyway. So Gary comes up, and we're videotaping. I got the cameras, you know, and the guys are all around. All right, Gary, what, what possessed you to do this? And he talks about, it. I'm just tough. I said, I know you're tough, but you're not as tough as Fritz von Erich. Oh, you think I'm not tough? I said, look, I know what you've been through, and I know you're a tough guy, but physically, you're not Fritz von Erich. Yeah, well, you think you're so smart. I said, no, I don't think I'm smart. I've been around this for a while. Yeah, well, you teach that course up at that big college up there, and you think you're smart. I said, Gary, it has nothing to do with my teaching, of course, in North Texas. Yeah, well, I just want you to know I've been to school. Oh, I said, I'm sure you have. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm pretty smart because I've been to school, too. And I said, okay, when did you matriculate? Oh, about three or four times a week. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sitting there thinking, oh, I'm going to save this. <laughs> got to save it. The, engine, the cameraman and the engineers are all falling out laughing. Finally, I just said, Gary, what the heck? He said, what the hell does matriculate mean? <laughs> 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 oh, the life of, of these people. It's, been, it's just been wonderful, you know. Well, we didn't show you the... Yeah, show us, show us these two. Hey, one time, the destroyer was going into another territory. And he's in the ring, and he was a friend of mine, you know, as we have friends, as we see them every month or so. So he walks in after the bout, he said, I'm leaving. I don't think I'll be back. And I said, well, that's tough. He said, takes this thing off. I said, here, keep this. Someday it'll be worth a lot of money. And, I, and I, so I take it around, and uh, if I'm doing one of these interviews, and, I said, and I, it's got the original sweat inside, destroyer sweat. That's that's my that's my only 
favorite piece of material I've got. I've got some pictures at home, but I didn't bring with them. And this is my picture. Can, can you get that okay? Okay. Uh, I don't recall, I think this was a promotion either for the University of North Texas, which sounds odd, or the Sportatorium, I'm not sure which, but this is Wild Bill Irwin. And that's me hoisted up on his shoulders. And the tagline was, put me down. I, this is just a part-time job. <laughs> and you know, that hurt. <laughs> that hurt being held up there. We had so to you do... probably had to hold you up for a lot longer than it looks oh, like. Oh, yeah. yeah. Whoa, he did it several times. I wasn't hanging right. I wasn't holding my head up, trying to hold my head. That really hurt. But he was a wonderful guy. He still is a wonderful guy. Wild Bill Irwin and me. And this ran on the front page of the student... Uh, paper at North Texas, uh, because I taught there and broadcast there. And the president's picture was on the back page. I'm not sure he ever got over that. But that's, those are my two souvenirs.